Okay. Yes, no, I start with the classic. So uh, light bulb jokes are easy targets, so just, just restrain yourselves. It'll all be fine. Um, one of my worst nightmares is following Mark and talking about JavaScript, so wish me luck. Um, so I'm going to talk, as, as Dean said, something really practical about um, not so much theory, but really about how we're using um, secure ECMAScript in things. And I'm going to use a light bulb as an example for that. Um, this is an old quote, easy, totally, completely true, not controversial here. Um, this, is, um, this is a twit tweet from yesterday um, about somebody who discovered that their flashlight has firmware that can be reprogrammed. A flashlight. A flashlight. Um, so this gets to why we care about secure ECMAScript and JavaScript. So this is my uh, proposed law. If you can put a microcontroller in something, we will. Um, all it takes is a tiny battery. Um, and then there's the corollary from Modable, which is, <laughs> yes, once you've got the microcontroller, it's only time until you get to JavaScript. So um, this stuff matters. We're putting software everywhere. When Mark did uh, his first presentation at TC53, um, earlier this year, we were talking about wearables, and he decided to scare us and say it gets worse. It's implantables. Uh, it's coming. And there really is software and pacemakers and things like that. So this is not even uh, speculative. It's real. Um, so we need to be able to trust this stuff. So Modable, we make the XS JavaScript engine. Uh, we, Patrick, but we. Um, and it's focused on small devices. So it's completely different than every other engine you've run into. We, we obsess about how do we fit into something small, how small. Uh, a typical target for us, and the one we're using here today, has 80 kilobytes of RAM. That's kilobytes, not, not megabytes, gigabytes, kilobytes. A meg of storage, that's for your code and everything. Um, and runs on an 80 megahertz CPU, one core. One, one core, not threaded, not nothing. And sells for a dollar and has Wi-Fi built in, which is awesome. It sells for a dollar. Um, so why? We put JavaScript in things. The list here is actually all things we have put JavaScript into. And when we do this, we're not putting JavaScript in to run some scripts on the edges. We're putting JavaScript in to run the whole device. Like More or less, our strategy is boot to JavaScript. As early as possible, we go there and we stay there. Um, the hardware is crazy cost sensitive. You, know, you say to people, oh, it's only a dollar and you get Wi-Fi. They're like, yeah, maybe you know, we, for 40 cents we can get pretty close. Um, and so you know, when you say, like, why don't you just you know, add you know, more and use Linux, they, they just laugh. Like, it doesn't happen. Um, so you really have to deal with the constraints. So uh, I, I love light bulbs as a test bed. The functionality is pretty simple, like on, off, bright, maybe color. Um, it's one of the smallest IoT things. They have Wi-Fi, a lot of them. Super cheap, super common. I don't have to explain to you what a light bulb is to get you to start to understand this stuff, hopefully. This is a light bulb that we love. Um, you can drop them on the floor. Um, this is really just the light with the, from the factory um, as, it, as it comes. This little chip in the middle is the $1 microcontroller. The little copper thing coming out is a Wi-Fi antenna. Um, and then there's LEDs around the side. And you can pick these up for like 18 bucks on Amazon in quantities of one. Um, and you know, they'll get cheaper, but already that's pretty spectacular um, for something with all that uh, power. Um, why the hell would I ever want JavaScript in a light bulb, you say? This is, this is a fair question. This is a fair question. Fortunately, smarter people than I have thought about this. This is literally a, a book from the uh, MIT Press that was published, uh, I think this year, maybe last year. The first chapter is The Meaning of Light. And it's, it's actually fascinating. Like, I, I was a little skeptical, but they really talk about all these ways that people use light um, for emotional support, to signal things inside the home to people who are you know, um, a little skittish or, or not like, so excited to always come out of their room, to create connections between people who are in different locations so they can know, oh, somebody just came home, um, but not like an annoying notification, just, oh, the light came on here, and I know mom's home. Um, and so it's really interesting, but it requires that we can control the behavior of light and do things that the manufacturer never intended. Um, so some of those are silly. I was hoping we were meeting in the nightclub downstairs. I was going to do some big light things, but no. Um, but we need to be able to change the behavior of the light. And here's the strange thing that I've found. Once you can change the software in a device, you start to have all sorts of strange ideas about how you want to change it. So 
really when you're driving home or sitting, on, sitting in your Uber or whatever, if you start to think, I could make the light bulb do anything, what would I want? Uh, the ideas will come. Um, there is a detail, though. It better be safe and secure. Um, this isn't just about leaking private information. There's a whole host of interesting issues. So let's um, dive into secure ECMAScript. So what does security on embedded devices look like these days? If you were out building a product and buying a microcontroller, every single salesperson would tell you, we have security nailed. We have secure boot. You can't like install unauthorized um, firmware because we do code signing. We obfuscate the ROM. We accelerate all the crypto. And this is all true and all works and is all great and is all useful. It's all focused on the same thing, which is I'm going to stop outside untrusted code from getting into my device. This is good. SES starts from this really other point. It says, I've let the untrusted code in the door. It has the run of the house. Now what am I going to do? And so you know, this is what happens when you know, early embedded devices had like, you know, 4K ROM. You could review every line of code and say, I trust it. This thing has a megabyte of ROM. That's getting hard to review everything. And you know, we're doing 4 and 16 meg products today. So you're using third-party libraries, which yeah, you can sometimes trust. Um, so we need to be able to, to bound that untrusted code and restrict what it can do. One of the things that it took me a while to get my head around with uh, Secure ECMAScript is that there is, unlike every other security solution I've seen on the planet, um, there is no security policy. There's no like access control language. There's no like rings of like authority. There's nothing. There's like literally nothing. You basically can take everything away and then build up what you want from there. And so the cool thing is you build the security policy in JavaScript. And each product gets its own security policy based on what it needs. A dryer needs something different than a light bulb. And so this is super cool because we don't have to wrestle about what should the policy be. We just have the mechanisms to do it yourself. Um, and we know that they work. And the other thing that is great is it's remarkably efficient. As I'll show you, we can take this security system and run it in this $18 light bulb. Um, just to, to highlight something that may not be obvious, like so much of the web obviously runs on a Unix computer or a derivative or an ins inspired by system, which has things like separate address spaces and sandboxing and different processes. If you have those, arguably you don't need Secure ECMAScript. You could do it another way. It would be heavier. We don't have those. We don't have an MMU. Right? We don't have protected memory. We get nothing. So if we don't do it in the language, there's nothing in the microcontroller to help us. So the language is really important. Okay, so Mark alluded to this a little bit um, in his talk, but I, I wanted to emphasize it because um, it, it's really important. So this is a typical embedded architecture that we use. At the bottom, there's an RTOS. Um, if you don't know what that is, it means a real-time operating system. A typical RTOS is like 10K of code. It's like enough to boot the device and allocate some memory and run a timer. And that's it. Um, so really, really simple. Um, on top of that, we put our JavaScript engine. There's like almost nothing in between the two. And then on top of that, we have the host. Um, and this is where things are a little weird, because in a browser, the host and the JavaScript engine are more like peers, or maybe the host is underneath. Um, and so the host is like native code. But in our world, the host is above the JavaScript application, and it's mostly in JavaScript. And then there's the application scripts. right? So this slide told you I just said. Um, so we do everything in C at the bottom, of course. JavaScript at the top, and the host is mostly JavaScript with just a little bit of C. Um, so when you want to enforce security, like a node or in the browser, you do that through the operating system and through the host, right? And that's what the browser has a million things to enforce security. In our world, we can't do that. The RTOS is too primitive. It knows how to allocate memory, not protect it. Um, the host is all in JavaScript. And so we have to have security mechanisms in JavaScript, or we have no security mechanisms at all. There's nothing to fall back on. So that's why when Mark said um, that TC53, which is embedded JavaScript um, modules, um, has selected uh, ECMAScript, uh, secure ECMAScript as our security model, it's out of pure necessity. There's not like something lower we can come back to. So either we have to invent something ourselves or adopt something. And, and CES is great, so why not? Um, 
And so the unit of encapsulation is called a compartment. In Mark's slides, they call it an evaluator. Um, and we'll, between us, someday arm wrestle that to the ground. Um, the concept is exactly the same, which is a compartment has its own globals and its own module list. Um, and so you can create those things. And so I'm going to show you some demos. I, I always learn better when I like actually step through code. So I'm going I'm to do a little bit of that. Um, th I will in a second. Uh, everywhere but here, actually. Um, yeah. Don't, don't worry. It'll be great in a second. Shared globals. So I'm going to do mcconfig d m. Excellent. So here I am in our debugger. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's on his to do list. That's his to do list. Yeah, not He's yet. only got 80K. I'm yeah, no. So, um, so we're making a new compartment. Um, the first argument is the name of the module to load. In Marks, it was the script to parse, but here it's the module to load. So this is the equivalent of what you would put in the from in an import statement. Um, and then this is a global. So we're adding increment, which is this function, to the global in the compartment. All right. So um, here we have a test function, you can see, and it's in the globals. And if I uh, probably won't show you every single thing, but so we have test, right, and we have uh, increment. And if we step into the module, we end up here. And so this is the mod, uh, the module we loaded. And you'll see here we should have increment, um, but we don't have test because we didn't put test in the list of globals to push through. And so now when we call this, what you'll see is the local test function is tracing 0 because it called increment once. Then we call the modules test function traces again. So they're sharing this increment function and consequently the, the global x. And there you go. So even though the global, the module doesn't have access directly to x, um, it can call, it can get to it through the increment function. Right? So it's, it's hidden even though it's a global. So there's two sets of globals. So let's look at a slightly different example. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So there was one other thing to do. So I remember this. I put it in my notes. So um, in the mod, Thank you. See, this is a little bigger. I can do, so this is the module that we load, right? So we can say global this dot pollute <laughs> equals dirty here. And uh, just, you know, so we really hit it. We'll, we'll do that. Nobody uses debugger keyboard except us. That's all good. Thank you. Um, so we're going to call the compartment. And you'll see we hit the debugger statement, right? And so it's going to create um, pollute in here. I'll put a breakpoint here so you can see it because the stepping's not going to quite do what I want. But when I come back out to the mod, when I come out back out to main, you'll see globals does not have pollute. But when I step back into the module, and I'm here again, then my globals have pollute. So you can pass stuff in, and the, the compartment can mess up whatever it wants to, but doesn't get back out the other side. So it really has its own independent universe. Okay, so, oh, thank you. Kill that. Uh, let's go to uh, restrictions. Just call me Mike. Uh, okay, so this example uses the module map. So we looked at globals. This is the module map. On the compartment constructor, there is a property called map, um, and that returns a list of all your modules, all the modules that the system has given you access to. Okay. And what you can see is basically on the left, you have um, the module specifier, and we use bare module specifiers. And on the right, you have a symbol which points to it. So you can't leak the path. Um, and so what we're going to do is first make a copy of the module map into a uh, map, and then call this mod. And so it imports increment, and then it traces never, because it should have never got here, because we're going to like hide increments. So if I come here. and uh, comment in the delete map increment, what we're going to do is take, um, oh man, I pressed that more than once. So we're going to delete increment from the map. So that will be no longer in here. So now when we go and run in the compartment, it says module increment not found, because now we've removed that from the list of modules it has. So this, like the globals, is a way for us to deny access to a compartment to a particular piece of code. Um, and we're going to use that mechanism on the light bulb in a minute. Um, so let me switch again. Sorry. 
Um, so this is the hardest one to remember. Modable examples, drivers. Oh, wow, that actually kind of worked. Um, perfect. Um, so we're going to CD blink and open main. All right, so this is just a, like, with one tiny change. This is straight out of our open source repository. Um, I have this light bulb. It has some software installed in it. If you're super, super sensitive to bright lights or blinking lights, don't look, but it's not too, too horrible. So this is running, this light bulb is running this code. Okay? And so all it does is it opens up an instance of the driver, and then it sets a timer. And on each tick of the timer, it changes from red, green, blue, warm, cool, um, and warm and cool, so six states. After it completes a cycle, it decreases the interval by 125 seconds, and so you get this effect, um, which is super annoying, so I'll unplug it. <laughs> um, but that, that JavaScript, I didn't install this here, but that JavaScript is really and truly running on this light bulb that I'm not going to drop. Um, I'm going to take the top off of it because we're going to reflash this thing, which is totally bold. Um, and so there's a few things here. I'm going to come back to my slides briefly. Um, there's a few things on the security of a light bulb we need to talk, talk about. So now you'll kind of understand compartments, hopefully. Um, so what do we want to do to the light bulb? Well, this light bulb has warm, cool, red, green, and blue lights, and it's got this LED driver. There's three things we want to stop user scripts from doing. Okay? One is we don't want them to be able to get to any configuration method, so they shouldn't be able to pull your Wi-Fi password. This thing really has Wi-Fi in it. Um, and it shouldn't be able to do anything you consider privileged, like setting the clock, because that could like, mess up your schedules, for example. Um, some of these products, and we've really worked on some that are like this, if you exercise the drivers to their full uh, range of possibilities, you will destroy the device. Um, and so like, if you were to run, I don't think this light bulb is the case, but imagine if you were to run the light bulb at full brightness for an hour, that would like, generate enough heat that it would damage the product and short its life or create a safety hazard. This is really true in some products. Um, there's another problem, which you just saw, which is in some environments, you may not want to switch the light's color very quickly because you will trigger seizures in some people, like really. And so it's, it's a health issue. And so you may want to control that when you deploy it into some environments. And so how do you do that in a way that is convenient for the developer um, but guarantees that these things aren't going to go completely crazy? So let's take a look at what we did. I hope Dean comes back. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I, 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 I deciphered that. Ah. Yeah, so I am going to open up. So we have a new main. So the main here, thanks, I can do this for a little bit, but, but somebody shouldn't go far. Um, so the main is going to create a compartment map. Um, it's going to create a, to start with the compartment map. And instead of deleting something from it, we're going to make, we're going to make a new one. And so Mark has taught me um, very strongly that blacklisting is terrible and whitelisting is great, because with whitelisting, you know exactly what you're going to get. So what we do here is we say, these are the three modules that we want the application to get to. Okay? So the first one is app, and that's just the module itself. So the source code you saw before in main got moved to app. So that's here, just because main is what we boot into, and so that's what the host owns. Um, but I'm saying map that particular module to the name main, because if this module imports itself, by saying import main, it should get back itself and not like get back your main application, which is the host. So that's one small trick. The next one is for the driver to be able to enforce like brightness constraints and flashing constraints, um, we need a special attenuated driver. So we, in the module map, we say take the, the specifier for the normal LED driver and replace it with this attenuated one. And we'll come back to that. And then we also give it access to the timer so it can do some blinky things. And then all we do is instantiate the compartment with main. I knew this thing. Yep. I have a cast of all stars for my, uh, my mic help. Thank you. Um, so then we, in, we invoke the compartment. And so um, let's look at the attenuated driver, that, which is really the interesting part. So what the attenuated driver is, does is it imports the original driver. Okay. It has a maximum brightness, which is 16, instead of 255, and has a minimum interval of 500 milliseconds. <coughs> so that's the, these are the limits we want to enforce. Um, because XS is insane about supporting everything in JavaScript these days, um, we use private variables and no constructor. 
um, to bring the uh, driver into existence and to remember the time of the last write at initialization. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The, uh, and then all the driver has is a write method after that. So we overload the write method. It gets colors. It's like you know red, green, blue, cool, form, whatever as numbers. So we we uh, we pull those into an array. This enforces the limit on being able to blink um, once every 500 milliseconds. Uh, you must blink no more than that. Um, and then this applies the brightness and then passes it along to the original driver. So we attenuate the, the brightness by whatever the maximum brightness is. And I'm actually going to program this into the light bulb just to show you that it actually can be done. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Um, so this is the, you remember when you uh, used to program computers by like flipping switches and all kinds of things? I literally have to flip a switch on this to put it into programming mode and then attach this funny little thing, which is easier than, it, harder than it looks. Okay. Then not drop it. And then here we just do uh, mcconfig dash d dash m dash p esp slash 80 to 85, I think. It'll tell me if I'm wrong. Yep. So uh, that's flashing the light bulb. So it's the entire firmware for the light bulb, including the Wi-Fi stack, secure ECMA script, XS, and all the scripts is 450K, and this is a debug build. Cool. Um, so once I flip this back to programming mode and reboot it by removing the power, You'll see we'll come up in the debugger here, and we're on my white, my white list. And so uh, here's the module map that I start with. And so these are all the things. Like I didn't want it to be able to get to config. I didn't want it to be able to get to resources. So I just make this module map of exactly what I want. Right? And so that is now my white list map here. So that's all the compartment can see. I can step into the compartment. And now you see it's the exact same code that was there before. Um, but when I go up oh, here, so you can see I'm doing writes. Let's see if I can uh, get to my attenuated driver. I can do it here. Perfect. Um, there's my attenuated driver. So I step into this, and now I'm not in the regular driver, but I'm in the attenuated driver. right? And so now I can come in here. I can see the colors, and everything is good. Um, and so I'll just let that run. And what you're seeing down below is when it's ignoring the writes. Um, and you can see as it picks up, so uh, more and more of them get ignored as this light speeds up. So what I'm going to do now is plug this in here. It takes a little longer to boot because it's a debug build, so it's looking for the debugger. Um, but once it does, and it will, you'll see the light is dimmer right, than it was before. And it starts out the same speed as before. But whereas before it would get insanely fast, now it will never change the color faster than every 500 milliseconds. So I've enforced all of that. I have not changed a line of code in the original script. Right? So the application developer doesn't know about this. As best I could do, they couldn't detect that they're running in this host either. Everything looks the same. Right? So we can change the rules on them later. We could change the rules based on a digital signature, whatever we want. But we get the behavior we want. And um, we've, purely, you know, we've virtualized, basically, the host here. And we've done it all in JavaScript. That's very good. Yep. And so, um, so yeah, so this is, I mean, it's, it's wild, but it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's really fits in this thing. And so um, just to sort of, yeah, no, you're great. Thank you. Um, just to wrap up, so secure ECMAScript on embedded is totally practical. Like this is, this is really not a fancy processor, and people are, are actually designing fancier things in these days than this. Um, it's fast. The, like creating the policies, as you can see, is like very straightforward, right? Like I think you could mostly follow the code that I wrote. Um, this is all here for you to try. Everything that I showed you except for my example is in our open source repository. You can buy this light bulb. We have instructions for soldering the header on, and you can, you can go crazy. Um, this is not completely done. The compartment interface is good. We're not sure it's great. Um, there's some refinement to do. You know, There probably is some security hole left somewhere that nobody has discovered yet. So we would encourage you to pull this code, code down and try stuff, build something find a problem, um, and contribute to helping to make this better. Because we think this could be a huge deal for JavaScript. As I said at a meeting, and Brian Turleson quickly tweeted, you all think you're doing really well because there's a lot of phones and servers out there. Try counting the light bulbs. It's a lot of places for JavaScript left to go. So thank you. Wait, before you go, yep. anyone have questions for oh, Peter? I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Yep. Just go to the Audible website. Repeat the question. Um, so, yep.
Uh, so the question is, if uh, Kate wanted to replicate this, she would just go to the Modable website. Yeah, everything is there. Um, and there, the only thing you have to do with these light bulbs is they really weren't designed to be reprogrammed. So you've got to solder a header on. And we have um, instructions in a blog post on how to do that. Yeah. In the software stack that you showed, the Hartos JavaScript engine. Yeah. And then uh, JavaScript, the host and the application. Yep. Two top loads of JavaScript. Yep. Yeah. How much of that is open source? Right? Uh, um, all of our code is. So the, the RTOS, it just depends on which RTOS you're using. Like we use free RTOS on an ESP32. Uh, so that is, uh, that's all open source except the Wi-Fi stack, annoyingly. Um, and that's the same on ESP8266. So it depends on your, uh, your chip vendor and what they've provided, basically. And this, this starts to look a little bit like Linux did in the early days of open source, where everything was open except for the drivers. Um, and I, I fear we're going to be in that space for a little while, but maybe not too long. So with some of yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we. I mean, on some devices, we boot to metal. Like we, we, we boot. We're the first thing that runs. We program some registers to get the clocks like running right, and then we just go. Um, so you can run really bare bones with XS if you want to. Yeah. If I if I may uh, channel the average Twitter user. Uh huh. <laughs> well, actually, no. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, the question is, uh, why JavaScript instead of C? So actually, I wouldn't say it's quite that. We, uh, we use a lot of C. Like, uh, like the driver for, to talk to the LEDs is actually in C because it's incredibly timing sensitive. And so we have some advantage in the embedded world that we can put some C in there because we're rebuilding the whole firmware, whereas you're not rebuilding the whole browser for your web page. Right? So we try to do as much as we possibly can in JavaScript. But you know the graphics engine should be in C, and so there's there's a line there, and we're constantly kind of exploring the, the limits of it. But why JavaScript is actually the more interesting question. Like um, C is awesome, but when you try to build, I mean, I've worked in it for far too long. But once you try to build like complicated systems, it's a disaster. Like it's, it doesn't have the structures, it doesn't have an object system. You can make one, but um, yeah. And JavaScript is fantastic for this stuff, and like really well thought out. And so you know our approach has been use. See where you need it to talk to native resources to be blindingly fast, and use JavaScript for everything else. And it turns out that everything else turns to be like 90 or 95 percent of the code in like a lot of products. And so you just move so much faster. You have whole classes of bugs that go away. You never read uninitialized memory, right? I mean, there's just all these really nice things. You don't tend to have memory leaks. Certainly not anywhere near as many as you do when you're working in C. And so our position is not that XS is the best way to build an embedded device using JavaScript. Our position, which the world will one day acknowledge, is that actually JavaScript is the best way to build embedded devices, period. Um, that they will be more secure. You'll build them faster. They'll be easier to change. They'll be more maintainable um, than any other way that people have to build those things today. So. Um, what are some other? Devices that you, other than light bulbs mm -hmm. that you try to do this with. So uh, you won't be surprised. We did a light switch. Uh, the question is, what besides light bulbs have we done? Um, you won't be surprised to know we did a light switch, um, and we actually it really plugs into our wall if you come by the office and it has a touch screen, so it's super pretty. Um, that one we haven't quite published yet, but it's great. You should, I mean, come by and see it. Um, one of our guys published a whole project on a uh, digital alarm clock that uses like uh, NeoPixels and is like completely ridiculously awesome. Like every feature you ever wanted in a digital alarm clock and more. Um, and we're working, uh, I mean, more seriously with uh, commercial vendors on putting this into products through TC53. I can say that one of the through their work in TC53, I can say one of those is Whirlpool, um, who are working with on a suite of white good products. Um, those aren't quite in the market yet, so I can't get into. The details, but um, you know, if you needed really clean clothes that were powered by JavaScript, we we might have you covered <laughs> pretty soon. That that's all. Um, so yeah. So the question is, JavaScript is uh, not really considered great for real-time work. Um, in particular, the garbage collector can give you unpleasant surprises. Um, so there's, there's a few things. What I mentioned on the, the LED controller, 
Um, in fact, I tried writing it in JavaScript, the LED driver, and failed because the timing wasn't precise enough. So we just don't always get there. That's one. Um, but the garbage collector turns out not to be a big issue. Um, and the reason is that on these things, we're running with such a tiny heap. Like on this light bulb, the JavaScript heap is like 20K, 16K. And even at 80 megahertz, you can like garbage collect that heap like 100 times a second, and you'll be fine. You will never notice like a hiccup from it, because there's just no work to do. Um, and so that's part of it. The other thing we do when we build our software, we're really sensitive to this. So we try to write our software so it doesn't create new objects except when changing states. Right? And so then you don't tend to be throwing off a lot of garbage collections in the normal operation just when you're moving to a new state. And in our debugger, if you saw on the left side, there's an instrumentation panel. And it actually shows you all the garbage collections and, on a timeline graph. And so you can see as you're running, oh my god, this operation is like you know, doing 100 garbage collections a second, and this other one's doing zero. And then you can go in and you know, piece that apart. So embedded development requires some discipline on things like that. But it's incredibly rare that we have the garbage collector be an issue once we sort of learned, learned what its characteristics were and how to work with it. So, Dean. Um, you had uh, your own custom development environment there. Do you also work with VS Code or WebStorm, any of the third level options? Sort of Debugging environment? So uh, yeah, so the question is about debugging environments. So right now we just have our own debugger called XSBug. Um, and it runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, so you're generally set. Um, and of course, XSBug is written in XS, so it's a completely JavaScript-powered JavaScript debugger. Um, the protocol's open, and uh, we actually have had uh, an open source developer who did a version of it that runs in a web browser, which is pretty wild um, over the network. Um, we haven't quite got that all sorted out, but it, it really does work. Um, and people have in the past done a visual, uh, visual code version of it, but it's not something we're actively so supporting. V8 essentially compatible with. Yeah, the V8 debugging protocol is really complicated. I mean, it's awesome. No, no offense if, if you're in the audience and you wrote it. Like, it's awesome. Um, but to be able to support a debugger on an embedded device, we need something really different. And so um, we have an incredibly simple debugging protocol that gets the job done, clearly. Um, so I mean, that's a, that's a place where uh, if the open source community, if somebody wants to do that, we'd love to support it. But it's not something that we've, we've chosen to invest in. So I, um, I'm going to stop. I, uh, I'm always a little uh, um, cautious about bringing JavaScript to, uh, bringing our work to a JavaScript audience, because it's always so web-centric. So I really appreciate the, the fact that you guys are so uh, attentive and interested in asking great questions. So thank you.